HIV is a retrovirus that attacks the immune system, leading to a weakened immune response. HIV targets and infect the CD4 plus cells in the body, which can impact the immune system ability to fight off the infections. If HIV is not treated effectively, it can lead to the development of AIDS. The virus spread through the body by fluids, including blood, semen, vaginal secretions, and breast milk. In the United States, there are approximately 1.2 million people living with HIV, and more than 14% of them are unaware of the infection. HIV is a small, roughly spherical virus with an outer envelope and genetic material in the form of RNA. It has a matrix and capsid that protects the genetic material. The virus has unique glycoproteins which can call GP120 and GP41 on the outer envelope that allow it to target and enter specific host cells, primarily the CD4 plus cells. HIV uses reverse transcriptase to convert its RNA into DNA, which can then integrate into the host cell's genome. The virus can remain latent within the cells, make it difficult to completely eliminate from the body. HIV is closely related to the simian immunodeficiency virus found in the chimpanzees and gorillas. It is originated from the SIVS found in primates in Central and Western Africa. HIV is a member of the lentivirus genus. There's two types of HIV, HIV-1 and HIV-2, with HIV-1 being responsible for the majority of HIV infections around the world. The virus constantly evolves through mutations and recombinations, which can lead to new strains with unique genetic features. As a viral pathogen, HIV needs the whole cell to replicate since it does not have its own metabolism. HIV targets certain types of immune cells like macrophages, dendritic cells, and CD4 plus cells. When inside an infected cell, HIV undergoes reverse transcription, which converts its RNA into DNA. The HIV genetic material then integrates into the host cell's DNA, creating a proviral genome. This can be transcribed into viral RNA, which can serve as a template for generating future viruses or HIV protein. HIV can also mutate and cause drug and immune resistance. HIV infection can impact the gut microbiome by altering its compositions and function, potentially leading to gastrointestinal symptoms such as diarrhea, weight loss, and malnutrition. Individuals infected with HIV have weakened immune system, which can make them susceptible to opportunistic infections caused by bacteria, fungi, and viruses, also parasites. Common OIS associated with HIV include tuberculosis, fungal infections, and as well as hepatitis B and C. Co-infection with other pathogens can worsen the course of HIV disease by promoting viral replication and immune activation, leading to increased disease progression. Access to healthcare and medication can be a major environmental factor impacting of HIV, particularly in low-income and resource-limited areas where access to the resources may be limited. This can impact the long-term health outcomes and quality of life for people who have HIV and people who live in the area. Once the virus is introduced into the environment and is not controlled effectively, there is a risk of transmission to other individuals who can become infected and develop HIV AEDS. HIV can contribute to the spread of pathogens and infectious disease in healthcare and waste management settings if proper precautions are not taken during the handling and disposals of contaminated materials. HIV can have serious health consequences and there's still no cure for the virus. Therefore, prevention and management of HIV is critical to reduce the impact on individuals and communities. Preventive measures such as practicing safe sex, using condoms, avoiding sharing needles, and getting tests for HIV can greatly reduce the risk of transmissions. Effective management of HIV can involve early diagnosis, proper medical care, sticking to the treatment plans, and making lifestyle changes to minimize the impact of the virus on the person's health and also the quality of life.
poliovirus is a virus that causes the disease polio and is part of a family of viruses called the Picorna viridae. Polio is a highly contagious disease that enters through the mouth and infects the throat and gastrointestinal system, then makes its way into the bloodstream and is carried to the central nervous system. People with poliovirus can be asymptomatic, have flu-like symptoms, and can even experience paralysis. Poliovirus is spherical in shape and is made up of RNA, a viral capsid, a shell around the capsid, a membrane around the cell, glycoproteins attached to the membrane, and cell receptors that help the virus attach to the host nerve cells. The genome of the poliovirus is made up of three main parts. The 5' non-coding region is approximately 10% of the genome and is covalently bonded to the 5' end of the viral protein. There is a single reading frame that encodes all of the viral proteins, which is split into capsid proteins and non-structural proteins. Lastly, at the end of the non-structural proteins is the 3' non-coding region. Since viruses are metabolically inert, they rely on the metabolic events in the host cells in order to generate its component parts and replicate. Because viruses manipulate host cells into building new viruses, each new virus is produced in its fully formed state and they do not grow. The interactions between bacteria and poliovirus is actually very interesting. Bacteria allows the poliovirus to become more stable enabling things such as enhanced thermostability, which is the virus's ability to withstand high temperatures without degradation by binding directly to gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. Gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria also provide protection against bleach, making poliovirus resistant to disinfection when binded with bacteria, and the binding to certain bacteria provide protection from heat stress. Bacteria also enhance the virus's strength in which it attaches to host cells. Because poliovirus lives in a person's throat and intestines, the virus is passed through person-to-person -person contact. Additionally, poliovirus lives in an infected person's feces, which means the virus can infect wastewater and, in unsanitary conditions, it can also infect bodies of water as well as food. That means always wash your hands before eating and after using the restroom. Okay, so I did my term project on the Coronaviridae viral family. The Coronaviridae family consists of positive, single-stranded, large RNA viruses with envelopes, and their taxonomy places them in needle virales. The, they are actually the largest known RNA viruses with genomes ranging 25 to 32 KB, Virons of 118 to 140 nm in diameter, and there are two subfamilies to the Coronaviridae. We have the Toroviridae, which has a helical nucleocapsid, and the Coronaviridae, which has a spherical nucleocapsid. I'll be focusing on the Coronaviridae subfamily, and within that subfamily, the SARS coronavirus 2 severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, which is our current pandemic. So it, as we all know, it enters through the nose, um, airway, and lungs until it meets an ACE2 receptor cell, and then it binds in that cell with the S spike protein, enters, and makes many copies of itself. And we see a lot of those ACE2 <clears throat> receptor cells, specifically in your heart, kidney, and gut, which is one of the reasons why it's causing chronic inflammation and can cause lots of pain in those areas. So they copies... The copies that are being made within the cell break out and infect other cells before the immune system is alerted because SARS coronavirus 2 and especially the newer variants can prevent and interpret those signals to the immune system, which is really unique. And that's why you can infect other people before you even show symptoms. <clears throat> so the mutation rates of SARS coronavirus 2 make it most similar to AIDS and hepatitis C like how fast the genome replicates is most similar to AIDS. Um, the, all coronaviridae viruses share the ability to move their polymerase complex during mRNA synthesis. This is another reason we see so many variants that's very unique. 
Just to be clear, AIDS and hepatitis C don't do that, but they're also um, fast. So multiple highly divergent variants of SARS coronavirus 2 are being seen, like Omicron, Delta, Alpha. So a large number of amino acid changes and mutations within chronically affected hosts, so hosts that are mainly in the acute stage of infection for more than five or six weeks. Um, because it stays in the host so long, all these mutations happen. But the interesting thing is that the variants that are emerged from these acutely affected hosts are passed to other healthy hosts. <sighs> so let's talk about my painting. Here it is. Um, I tried to make it personal because this pandemic has affected my work and my life so much. So first of all, let's really focus on this S spike protein that's binding to those receptors, letting it sneak in and control 60% of affected cells activity, which is insane. So Delta and Omicron variants have mutations in part of the S spike protein that bind to a cell, and these mutations help the virus completely evade antibodies. Terrible news. So RNA is single-stranded in red. I made it red, so you can see it clearly. Um, and then we have our N protein in blue, and that's creating this helix-type structure here. Um, the heart was just an artistic choice, but ignore that. This protein is responsible for identifying and wrapping the virus RNA into a helical structure. It also forms ribonucleoproteins, which are really cool. And then we have our E protein in yellow. So it's kind of embedded in the envelope, um, in the lipid envelope. And it self oligomerizes to form a pentameric ion channel making it a viral porin, and it triggers that inflammation in the host. And then we have our M protein in purple, also in the envelope. Um, and it's a, an abundant protein. So the closest known rel relative of the airborne SARS coronavirus 2 strain causing the current global pandemic was found in a bat in China, as we know, and that strain was rat g13 ratg13 but i wanted to talk about how the species currently displaying the most carriage of coronavirus besides humans is the canadian white-tailed deer which is actually present in parts of oregon and uh, maybe a reason not to go hunting this year if you're into that at least for white-tailed deer and one in three people so we've made a jump from one in five one in three people will be experiencing long covid and we don't really know what that means yet For my term project, I chose to do it on Ebola or Ebola virus. In 1976, Ebola virus first broke out in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and it had an 88% fatality rate. In 2014 to 2016, an outbreak in West Africa occurred, and it recorded over 28,600 cases. In 2018 to 2020, there was an outbreak in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo, which recorded 3,470 cases. And then in 2019, the Ebola virus vaccine was approved by the FDA. Some symptoms of Ebola virus include sudden onset of fever, sore throat, and malaise, followed by severe rashes, diarrhea, and ultimately multiple organ failure. Ebola virus is highly transmissible through bodily fluids, and in research done on primates, it has been found that as few as 10 plaque forming units can cause disease, which makes it highly infectious. It also has an average fatality rate of 50%. The virus itself is classified as a filovirus, meaning it is an enveloped, non segmented, negative stranded RNA virus. It has a long, sometimes branching, thread-like shape, and each virion is about 14,000 nanometers long and 80 nanometers in diameter. The genome codes for seven different proteins, which each have an important role in protecting the RNA and or getting the RNA into the host cell. The infection process first occurs when the virus uses a viral spike made of glycoproteins located on the envelope to attach to the host cell at the glycoprotein receptor sites. The viral genome is then released into the host cell. 
The virus is replicated as the host cell replicates, using the host cell's ribosomes to transcribe its own proteins. Ebola virus targets macrophages and dendritic cells in the host to disable the immune system. It then infects cells of the liver, spleen, and other tissues, which leads to the multiple organ failure. The vaccine, called ERV-EVO, was approved by the FDA in 2019, and as of 2021, it has been administered to over 290,000 people. It was created off the vesicular stomatitis virus. Basically, they just swapped the VSV glycoprotein gene for the Ebola virus glycoprotein gene. The specifics of the vaccine mechanism are still highly unknown, but the vaccine does target the envelope glycoprotein of the virus. And it has also been seen to impact anti-GP antibodies and monocyte recruitment. The anti-GP antibodies aid in the liver and spleen, which are some of the primary attack points of the virus. And then monocytes become macrophages and dendritic cells, which are the cells that are initially impacted by the virus. Thanks for watching. Hope you learned something new. All right, today we're going to be talking about norovirus. Norovirus is a virus with I icosahedral symmetry, and it comes from the Caliciverde family. One relative it's most notably similar to is the sapovirus, which also causes acute gastroenteritis, similar to norovirus. Norovirus is a positive sense, non-enveloped, single-stranded RNA virus that is made up of three overlapping reading frames. Each reading frame encodes for something specific within the, within the virus. For example, open reading frame 1 is responsible for coding structural and non-structural polyproteins that play a role in host spreading, while OFR2 and OFR3 encode for capsid protein. Because viruses are chemically inactive by themselves, that means they depend on a host for metabolic properties. Noroviruses specifically use complex carbohydrates known as histo blood group antigens to reproduce asexually. The virus will bind to HBGAs found in saliva and begin translation from there. After translation occurs, polyproteins are released and the norovirus will interact with several lymphoid structures found within the human body. Macrophages, T cells, B cells, and other bodily defenses can become infected with proteins from norovirus. While there is limited research on microbial interactions, it's been speculated that pre existing levels of microorganisms in the human microbiota can impact the severity of symptoms caused by norovirus. Furthermore, it's been noticed that the levels of bacteroids, proteobacteria, and firmicutes can fluctuate in the intestinal region during infection. Imbalances like these may be apparent, but or microorganisms like lactobacillus can aid in the recovery of norovirus symptoms. The probiotics that they produce may lead to a quicker recovery time overall. On the contrary, on the contrary, Enterobacter cloacae can appear similar to HBGAs, which can actually lead to an increased infection. This can increase the overall severity of the symptoms. Norovirus is capable cap capable of spreading to numerous organisms besides humans. Livestock, wildlife, and pets may all be infected with norovirus. Viral spread may happen between humans and animals, but it's been rarely observed that norovirus spreads from animals to humans versus the other way around. Norovirus is known to attack the intestinal region and cause acute gastroenteritis. This infection can lead to symptoms such as vomiting, nausea, diarrhea, and various aches. These symptoms tend to show within 48 hours of exposure and can last one to three days overall. Since this is a viral infection, antibiotics are useful uh, use, sorry, useless, which means treatment consists mostly of self-care. Norovirus is extremely contagious and is able to infect organisms with only a few particles. It mostly spreads through the, the fecal matter of an infected individual. Norovirus particles can be released into the air after flushing a toilet, which can make, which can infect anyone nearby. Spreading can also occur through an infected person touching external services and objects. If an uninfected person handles those same spots and then touches their mouth, they can also become infected. Norovirus outbreaks are not uncommon and can be caused by the treatment of different food items. These food items can be treated with water that is contaminated, which makes them norovirus carriers. 
Food products that are commonly norovirus carriers consist of leafy greens, shellfish, and fruits. This mode of spread can lead to restaurant contamination. Moreover, high levels of spreading are often seen in school settings as many children or humans are working closely together. In some cases, being infected with norovirus can lead to a hospital visit, especially for those who are very old or young. Overall, it's been estimated that norovirus costs $60 billion worldwide in healthcare costs a year. And yeah. My microorganism is respiratory syncytial virus. It is also known as RSV. RSV is a respiratory infection that can cause cold-like symptoms such as fever, cough, decrease in appetite, runny nose, sneezing, shortness of breath, wheezing, and sore throat. RSV infection can be very critical to infants younger than 18 months, the elderly, and those who are immunocompromised. It is a large, enveloped, negative-sensed, single-stranded RNA genome, spherical, filamentous, and asymmetrical. It belongs to the pneumovirus genus of the pneumoviridae family. It contains a matrix protein, attachment glycoprotein, large polymerase fusion protein, phosphoprotein, small hydrophobic protein, nucleoprotein, negative ssRNA, M2-1, and M2-2. RSV was originally characterized in 1956 from a colony of chimpanzees. It was renamed as respiratory syncytial virus because it causes cells to fuse with neighboring cells. RSV is spread through respiratory droplets in the air or surfaces when an infected person coughs or sneezes. Infection most often begins um, as an infection in the nasal epithelial cells. The attachment glycoprotein begins by attaching the virus to the epithelial cell. Then the fusion protein begins to fuse with the cell membrane and enters the cytoplasm. Once infected, the virus consumes all of the host cell's energy and structural compounds to reproduce. The virus begins to work through the cell's cellular metabolic pathways into the central carbon pathway, which includes glycolysis and the citric acid cycle. These pathways generate energy. RSV interacts with another microorganism by the name of Streptococcus pneumonia. When these two viruses interact with each other, patients present with clinical complications such as pneumonia and bronchiolitis. Pneumonia is a virus that infects the lungs and that can cause high fevers, shortness of breath, low oxygen rates. It can also cause chest pain, fast labored breathing, and even death. Pneumonia is the leading cause of children hospitalization and the most significant cause of death in children under the age of 5. Environmental factors that are linked to RSV include tobacco smoke, air pollution, indoor crowding such as nursing homes, hospitals, daycare, and schools. It was also found that RSV hospitalizations are associated with colder temperatures. It is important to always wash your hands, disinfect highly touched surfaces, to cover your mouth when you cough or sneeze, and to stay indoors when you are sick. Hey everyone, in my presentation, I'm going to be talking about the prion protein and its conversion into a more aggressive. Uh, form of the protein. So here we have a normal prion protein. In the image, you can see that there are four helixes, two small helixes and then two of the big helixes. The two small helixes are most likely helix A's and the big helixes are helix B and C. The C helix is the helix that is connected to the strand with the red tip. You can find these proteins virtually almost everywhere in the human body, but it's more they're more commonly found in the cerebral spinal fluid, which then travels up to the brain. And once a misfolded prion protein occurs, can do a lot of damage. Um, there has actually been studies showing that a misfolded protein can be found in the dermis of the skin and once found can be used to see if a person will develop 
uh, brain degenerative disorder later on in life. <clears throat> and as for the function of the normal prion protein, uh, we really don't know what the function is, but we can hypothesize that it's their function is either assisting in synapses, um, cellular adhesion, and cell-to-cell -cell communication amongst other cells within our body. Now, normally these proteins are harmless, but as you can see in the image to the left, there can be an error in the replica replication process to where it'll create a misfold in the protein and more commonly in the A helix. But to better understand how this can happen, we gotta know the metabolism of the prion protein. So the prion protein undergoes synthesis in the endoplasmic reticulum of cells as a precursor protein, which undergoes post-translational post modifications, including glycosylation and disulfide bond formation to acquire its final conformation. And once this is done, after the synthesis, the prion protein is transported to the cell surface and anchored to the plasma membrane via GPI anchor. You, that's not the actual name of it. You guys can go look it up, but the name is ridiculously long and yeah, I'm not gonna try that. Um, the GPI anchor allows the prion protein to interact with other proteins and cellular structures. And throughout this process, there's so many ways that this protein could go wrong, which doesn't happen all the time, but it can happen where there will be a misfolding in the protein. The misfolding is this the misfold is isoform or the, the misfolded isoform has a high beta sheet content and a propensity to form aggregates and amyloid plaques. Consequences of a misfolded prion protein. So a misfolded prion protein could lead to several brain degenerative diseases, including but not limited to um, Alzheimer's, um, Peru, um, and Jake Prutzfeldt's Jacob disease, as shown here on the screen. A sample to the right, control sample, is a healthy brain, and this just shows how devastating the misfolded prion protein can be once it enters the cerebral spinal fluid and the cerebral spinal fluid pumps it up to the brain and it forms these plaques to where our immune cells uh, just eats away at these plaques but at the same time are eating away at our brain because plaques are composed of a spongiform cell of our brain. So what the Creutzfeldt's, what the disease, uh, what the disease prion protein would like to do is it'll attach itself onto a healthy cell. And then what it will do is basically pump a bunch of fluid into the cell, which gives it a spongiform look. The spongiform look is seen as a foreign, is seen as hostile or foreign to our immune cells, which then come by and, um, inflame our brain and just everything just goes downhill from there. Um, these types of diseases can affect the way we breathe, can affect the way we move, our thought process, everything. It's basically attacking, it's basically like putting a virus in our, in a computer and the computer just loses function in each one of its systems one by one. It's what's going on here, but in a biological form. Um, yeah, that, I just wanted to add on a little bit more from the previous slide. Um, and while I do so, here is an image of a diseased brain with, or diseased tissue with furu and a normal tissue. Um, but I wanted to add on that there are many ways to obtain this, um, misfold in the prion protein, and it could be through genetics, it can be through um, eating contaminated meat, whether that be uh, meat from an animal or 
uh, human meat, which is, I guess, also an animal. And it could also happen spontaneously. So it could just one day your prime proteins just decided not to replicate uh, normally and boom, you have uh, the disease prime protein. And these uh, diseases that come after a disease prion protein are incurable. So it's no matter if you do get it and we find it early on, we, there's not really a whole lot we can do but give people more comfortable life towards the end of life. Um, the most, the longest I've read that a person can live to was two and a half, three years. Um, and yeah, 